Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video, we're gonna be talking about a special test known as the cervical flexion rotation test. This is a special test that's used to look at really two things. One is the mobility of the atlantoaxial joint, particularly in patients with upper cervical spine pain, and also as a comparable sign for cervicogenic headache. In fact, you'll often see this is a special test that's used in the diagnostic criteria for cervicogenic headache. Now on cervicogenic headache, recall that those types of headaches come from referral from the upper cervical spine. The lower cervical spine really doesn't refer to the head. It's really just that upper cervical spine. And so if you're performing this test and it reproduces a cervicogenic headache, that is a good idea that the headache is in fact cervicogenic and also in the treatment course for it, you should be doing some kind of treatment on the atlantoaxial joint. Now, speaking of the atlantoaxial joint, somebody may not have cervicogenic headache, but they may have localized pain in the upper cervical spine. Perhaps it's atlantooccipital, but in some cases there may, may be an atlantoaxial component. And so if you perform this test and it reproduces their familiar upper cervical spine pain, well, it suggests that the at least one of the pain generators is in the atlantoaxial joint. Perhaps you should do some mobilizations of that joint. So without boring you any further, let's get into the performance of the test right now. So to perform the cervical flexion rotation test, the patient will be positioned in supine, as you see over here in the video clip, and the PT will passively move the patient's neck into maximal flexion. Let's take a look at that right here. So there is maximal cervical flexion. Now, if we consider the various joints of the cervical spine, we have really the entire lower cervical spine, and that certainly allows movement in the sagittal plane, so flexion and extension. And then we have the atlanto-occipital joint between the occipital condyles of the skull and the, and the atlas, and that certainly allows flexion and extension. But if we consider the atlanto-axial joint between C1 and C2, it really doesn't allow very much flexion and extension. That joint really participates in rotation. In fact, about half of the rotation of the entire cervical spine is accomplished through the atlantoaxial joint. Now, why is that important? Well, there's a law, it's called Friette's third law. He has three laws. The first two don't really pertain to this at all, but the third one's very important. Let's suppose you have a joint, and really we're talking about the lower cervical spine here, that allows movement in three planes. So yes, it allows movement in the sagittal plane. It allows movement in the frontal plane and also the transverse plane. Well, if I maximally take up all the position in one of the planes, as in cervical flexion, and that's the sagittal plane, then it dramatically reduces, and we can even say almost abolishes, any movements in the other two planes. In other words, if I have this maximal cervical flexion right here, then the lower cervical spine, which is maximally flexed, it's got all available movement taken up in the sagittal plane, so you shouldn't have any movement in the frontal or transverse planes here. And the important one is the transverse plane. So if I were to then passively rotate the head in this position, the lower cervical spine will not be able to participate in that rotation by Friette's third law. And so any rotation that I now am able to obtain with this is coming from the upper cervical spine, really the atlantoaxial joint. So that's why this is a good test to assess for atlantoaxial rotation. And again, other things that we mentioned at the start of the video, okay? So make sure you understand Friette's third law and why this is looking at the atlantoaxial rotation. As I've kind of insinuated, uh, while maintaining this passive cervical flexion, the PT then passively rotates the patient's neck to end range. Sorry for the misspelling there. So there's left rotation, okay? And again, because the lower cervical spine is maximally flexed by Friette's third law, it really can't participate in rotation. And so this rotation that we're getting right here, this is due to the atlantoaxial joint. And the PT can assess the degree of movement with a goniometer. That's a little hard to do when you're holding with two hands, so you might have to have uh, another person there to do that, or you can just eyeball it. And you're also listening for subjective reports of patient's pain here, okay? Of course, I'm also gonna compare this to the other side. Presumably, the left side I just looked at there might have been the unaffected side. Maybe this is the symptomatic side here, okay? And I'm assessing that rotation there as well, okay? 
So what is a normal value for this cervical flexion rotation test? Well, normally that atlanoaxial rotation should be at least 42 degrees. A positive test occurs with one of two things, sometimes both, when the atlanoaxial rotation is less than 29 degrees on either side. So let's say here we're testing the asymptomatic side first, okay? We do left cervical rotation, and that's certainly more than 42 degrees. That's normal or negative on that side. When we test the right side, let's say that's the symptomatic side, let's suppose she's only able to get to there. Well, we could take a goniometric measurement, or we could just eyeball that, but that right there is clearly less than 42 degrees. It's actually less than 29 degrees, and that would constitute a positive test. So in this case, because right atlantoaxial rotation is restricted, we know that there's an upper cervical rotation restriction on the right side, particularly right atlantoaxial joint, okay? Now the other thing that this might do is it might reproduce the patient's familiar pain. Now that pain could just be neck pain. It could be upper cervical spine pain. And if that's the case, well then we know what it is. It's an atlantoaxial restriction on the right. But it also may reproduce cervicogenic symptoms such as headache. Um, it could also reproduce some dizziness as well. That would clue you in to do some of the tests for cervicogenic dizziness, okay? Uh, but it could also reproduce cervicogenic headache. And this test, as we mentioned, is often included as one of the diagnostic criteria for cervicogenic headache, okay? Um, it could do either of these things, and in either case, that constitutes a positive test. Now, a questionable result, meaning you need to dig a little further, is when the rotation is between 29 and 42 degrees. Okay, you can't necessarily call that a positive test, but it does warrant further investigation. Okay? Now, the psychometrics of this test are very good. The sensitivity is 91% and the specificity is 92%. So on the sensitivity, if the cervical flexion rotation test is negative, then there's a 91% chance that this person does not have a pathology of the upper cervical spine, particularly the lateral axial joint or cervicogenic headache. And if the test is positive, there's a 92% chance that the person does have those pathologies. Now, the exact pathology depends on what the comparable sign is. Is it just a joint restriction with reproduction of neck pain? Well, then there's a 92% chance that it's atlantoaxial in origin. If it reproduces their headache, then it's a 92% chance that they have cervicogenic headache, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully you learned a lot about the cervical flexion rotation test here. Uh, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you so much for watching this video.